Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? So you can tell that I'm the mathematician because I'm not the practical one. I'm the one who knocked the glass on the table. I'm not the, the engineer. So, so good morning, everyone. I'm David Galvin, and I'm here to tell you what being a mathematician is about. But first, a pop quiz. <sighs> Don't worry. This one's easy. It's the end of the fourth quarter. Your team's up by three points. Your opponent is going for a field goal to tie the game, bring it to overtime. Now they bring on their backup quarterback to be the holder. You know that eight of the last 10 times that he's been the holder, they faked the kick and gone for a touchdown. Question, what do you do? There's a lot of different options. But probably, if you want to win the game, you defend against the sneak touchdown pass. What you're doing here is observing a pattern and acting on it. What you're doing is being a mathematician, because mathematics, at its heart, is the search for and the study of patterns. There are some mathematicians, topologists, who study broad patterns of shape. A topologist can't tell the difference between a coffee mug and a donut. This is a piece of ceramic with a single hole through it, the handle. This is a piece of dough with a single hole through it, the donut hole. They are the same shape. There are other mathematicians, geometers, who study the fine details of patterns of surfaces. A geometer would say there are some parts of the coffee mug, like the bottom of the mug, that are flat. But unless you sit on it, there's no part of the donut that's flat. They are different surfaces. There are other mathematicians, analysts, who study patterns of motion, such as how the heat is flowing from the hotter coffee mug out into the cooler room. I'm not a topologist. I'm not a geometer. I'm not an analyst. I'm a combinatorialist. I drink the coffee. I eat the donut. And I think about patterns among numbers. You're all familiar, I'm sure, with the what comes next in the sequence puzzles. Here's an example. This one's pretty easy. What comes next? Yes, these are just the ordinary counting numbers. OK, let's do a more interesting example. What comes next in this sequence? I'm hearing a lot of answers, but I just heard 21. Thank you so much. What you did was you noticed the pattern. The pattern is that each number is the sum of the two previous numbers. So that means that the next number in the sequence, if this pattern continues, should be 8 plus 13 or 21. This sequence of numbers is called the Fibonacci sequence. We've been studying it for over 2,000 years. It comes up in computer science, in biology. It even comes up in art. Here's a, a, another example. This one, this one is not as easy. At first, it seems like you're multiplying each term by 3 to get the next term. But that pattern breaks down after a while, and it's not clear how it's continuing. I'm going to get back to this sequence in a while. but. First, let me give you an example of the sort of problem I think about that leads me to patterns among numbers. Let's say you like to go for a run every evening, a long run, 72 blocks. Why 72? Well, maybe you're a big fan of Travis Frederick. Ah, I see he has some fans here. Yay. So. You set out on your run from your house, which is the red dot at the center of the city, and you pick a direction to run in. And then each time you come to an intersection, you either go straight ahead, or you turn left, or you turn right. Now, you like variety. You like change of scenery. So you have a rule. You never revisit a spot that you previously visited on your run. Here's an example of how your run might begin. Here is an example of a way that your run is not allowed to begin 
notice that there are some intersections that you visit multiple times here. Now, as I say, you like variety, you like change of scenery, so you don't want to repeat a run from night to night. For how long can you keep this up? How many different 72 block runs are there? Well, this is a pretty ambitious question, so let's approach it step by step. It's pretty clear that there are four one block runs because you can set out north, east, south, or west. Now, each of these one block runs can be extended in three different ways to a two block run. You can go straight ahead, left, or right. So that means that there are three times four, or 12, two block runs. Each of these two block runs can also be extended in three different ways. If you go straight straight, you can go straight ahead, left, or right. If you go straight turn, you can go straight ahead, left, right for your third block. So that means there are three times 12, or 36, three block runs. There's a pattern emerging, multiply by three each time. But when you come to four block runs, you have to start being a little bit careful. Most three block runs can be extended in three different ways, like go north, 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 or go north, east, east. But there are some three block runs, like north, east, south, that can only be extended in two different ways if you want to obey the rule about not revisiting a spot you had previously visited. So you have to do this count with some care. If you do it carefully, you'll find that there are exactly 100 four block runs. So now I can go back to my sequence, and you should recognize these numbers now. 4, 12, 36, 100. This is the sequence counting the number of runs of various different lengths. If you have a lot of patience and you're very careful, you can figure out that the next number in the sequence is 5,916. I bet no one guessed that. <laughs> so, for over 70 years, mathematicians, physicists, and chemists have been studying self-avoiding runs. Literally millions of computer hours have been devoted to the problem. Recently, a mathematician from Australia, Iwan Jensen, was able to calculate the exact number of 71 block runs. There are this many of them. This is an enormous number. If you wanted to store all of these runs on a computer, which is what you need to do if you wanted to push the count up to 72 blocks, you would need a very big hard drive. 100 gigabytes would not be enough. 100 terabytes would not be enough. You'd actually need a hard drive that had about 100 billion billion terabytes. For this reason, although we know roughly how many 72 block runs there are, there are a lot, we don't know the exact number, and we probably won't know for a long while. Now, at this point, everybody, I imagine, has one question and one question only. Why on earth would I or anybody else care at all about this question? I'm going to give you two answers. I'm going to give you the official answer, and then I'm going to give you the real answer. Here's the official answer. Self-avoiding runs actually come up in a number of scientific problems. Here's an example from chemistry. Polymers are long chains of atoms. They are everywhere. Rubber and polystyrene are polymers. At the micro level, so are DNA and protein. These chains of atoms, they don't go around in long, straight lines. They twist and bend and turn in all kinds of ways. Here are some pictures of actual nanopolymers. Now think about how one of these polymers might wiggle. Each atom along the chain locates itself nearby to the previous atom on the chain, but there's a very, very important rule that has to be obeyed, which is that no atom is allowed to locate itself where an atom had previously located itself. There just isn't room. Just as when you came in here earlier this morning, you couldn't sit on a seat that someone else had already taken. That means that as you trace along the wiggles of a polymer, you're actually tracing a self-avoiding run. And anything that you can say about self-avoiding runs translates immediately into something about polymers. How many self-avoiding runs are there? That's how many polymers there are. How far from home are you when you finish your run? That's how far apart the ends of the polymer chain are. 
Here's another example. This one is coming from physics. When water cools to freezing, ice crystals begin to form. Here's a, a very a close up of an ice crystal forming on a plate of water. About 50 years ago, physicists developed a model called the lattice gas model to help explain this process of ice crystal formation. It's a very simple model, but it's complex enough that there are still questions about it that we're not able to answer. With some colleagues from Georgia Tech, from Berkeley, and from Columbia, I've been looking at this model recently, and we've discovered a really strong connection, not quite to self-avoiding runs, but to self-avoiding drives. Draw a very fine grid on the surface of the water, and imagine that it's a map of Manhattan with its one-way system. Even-numbered streets run east-west, odd-numbered streets west-east. Even-numbered avenues run north-south, odd-numbered avenues run south-north. A self-avoiding drive is a drive around Manhattan that doesn't revisit an intersection, just like a self-avoiding run, but also that obeys the one-way system, which, of course, a runner doesn't have to do. What we discovered was that the boundaries of these ice crystals follow exactly the paths of self-avoiding drives. So using the mathematical theory of self-avoidance, we're able to significantly enhance our understanding of this model and begin to answer some of these 50-year-old questions. OK, that was the official answer to the question, why do I care? Now, let me tell you the real answer. This is a startlingly simple question. We've all understood it in just a few minutes. It's simple, but it is absolutely not easy. It has challenged some really smart people for generations. With science, we can do really amazing things. We can send a probe to the surface of Mars and have it beam back crystal clear pictures. We can build prostheses for a Marine who has lost both his legs in combat. But mathematics is filled with seemingly simple questions that turn out to be fiendishly difficult when you start to look at them carefully. I consider these questions a personal challenge from nature to my intellect. I relish the time spent grappling with them, trying to pin down their complexities. Many of you, I'm sure, play card games. Who plays card games? And many of you maybe do Sudoku puzzles. Does anyone do Sudoku? Or crossword puzzles, maybe. So all of these things are really great mental exercises. The problems that I'm talking about here, these are the ultimate in mental athletics. Solving one of them, it's an unparalleled high. It's scoring the winning touchdown in a championship game. Making genuine progress on one of them, even if I don't solve it, that's still really satisfying. That's still winning the game. The fact that many of these problems have practical applications, that is a really lovely bonus. But it's just that. It's just a bonus. It is a minor consideration beside the intellectual thrill of the search for truth. My colleagues and I, mathematicians and all scientists here in this room, all around the country, all over the world, we are all on the same team tackling these really hard problems. We all want to play the best game that we can. We all want to win. But more than anything else, we all want to play because we love the game. And let me tell you something really nice. I don't have to retire at 30 because I've blown out my knee. I can keep doing this for as long as I like. Let me go back to the pop quiz. Remember that it was the end of the fourth quarter. You're up by three points. Your opponent is going for a field goal to tie the game. You could just send a handful of defenders out onto the field, have them bumble around randomly. Whatever the outcome, I don't think that it could be very satisfying. Or you could examine the situation and make a decision based on some sound principles of reasoning. 
if you are absolutely sure that they're going for the field goal, then throw everything at blocking it. But if there is evidence, a pattern, that suggests that they might fake the kick, then defend against the sneak touchdown pass. When you apply yourself like this, making a decision based on observation, and then executing your plan, then whatever the outcome, win, lose, or heaven forbid, tie, you will have the satisfaction of achievement. You faced a challenge, and you used all of your resources to tackle it, including your mental resources. And that is what being a mathematician is all about. Thank you very much. Does anyone have, have any questions? Yes, we have a question down here. So the, can you ask which? Yeah, so the, so the question is about geometry, which is something that I'm sure that you're all studying at the moment, which is a very beautiful subject about shapes that includes curves and cones and parabolas. And you, you might be thinking that this, this has nothing to do with the world, this has nothing to do with your life, but in fact, the geometry that you're learning now, the algebra that you're learning now, these, this is the language of science. This is the language that all scientists, all engineers, all mathematicians use to talk to each other, to frame their problems. It's, it, is, it is something that is incredibly useful in so many different realms. Thank you, thank you so much for the, the question. There's, yep, okay, we have a question way down the back. What made you so interested in mathematics? What made me interested in mathematics? That is, that is a wonderful question. So, so mathematics gripped me when I was very, very young, when I discovered that it was a, this wonderful game of you have a rule book. The rule book tells you what objects you have, how those objects combine with each other, and then you get to play all kinds of wonderful games with this rule book. You get to build all kinds of wonderful, beautiful structures. Now, there are some people who are really great with their hands and really great with their eyes, and when they think about building beautiful structures, they become architects, they become engineers. There are some of us who, well, we're not so good with our hands. You just saw me with that stupid uh, glass of dirty water. And, and the, the appeal of these mind games, of building these beautiful structures with my mind was what attracted me to mathematics. It was not until many, many years later to, that I discovered that many of these things that I love to think about actually have real practical applications. Thank you so much. Yes, we have a, a question here. Um, do you oh, think anybody we'll will, do you think anybody will Do you think anybody will find out the 75th number of that equation? Yes, I'm absolutely sure because there are so many people working on problems like this. What we're able to do, it improves so much as, as years go by. Now, I showed you that huge number and I said, you couldn't possibly store all those in a computer. So you might be wondering, how do we even get that far? But there are some really clever tricks that scientists have come up with to try and make the count easier to do. Basically, there's a game that you play with squares that have curves on them, and you put the squares together to make longer and longer curves. Well, basically, uh, a, a scientist came up with a way of turning that game into a technique for counting these walks. And it takes a lot of time, but as computers get faster and as our brains get better, we're, we're, going, to, uh, we're, going, to, we're going to improve the count, yes. And we have one, one question here. Fibonacci numbers, yeah. Yes. yes. 
So the question was that, that the Fibonacci sequence, I said that that comes up in a lot of spheres, including in, in biology. And it turns out that if you look at a lot of plants and you look at the way that leaves are configured, you will see that the Fibonacci sequence is, is popping up all over. And why we're interested in that is that because it tells us that there is some kind of a commonality between things that on the surface look different from each other. And this is one of the major goals of science, to try and understand common themes that are existing in areas that seem initially like they're, they're different from one another. So seeing the Fibonacci numbers as a uniting theme that unites lots of different aspects of biology is very interesting to biologists. Um, well, how, how are we doing, Mary? So, okay, so, so one more question or? Yeah, so, so one more question. Uh, yes, you're standing up the tallest. How many years did it take me to become a mathematician? I'm afraid that I am not able to answer that question because it's going to be far, far into the future that I finally know all the things that I would love to know about mathematics. But the practical answer to the question is that um, I, I was an undergraduate at the University of Cambridge in England, and then I came to Rutgers in New Jersey to do my PhD, and I studied mathematics for about 10 years. And at that point, I began to, to teach mathematics, and I began to do mathematical research. So it's, it's about a 10-year process, but actually it's a lifetime process. One is always learning, one is always asking questions, one is always discovering new things. I have discovered a ton of new things today from listening to my colleagues. And that's probably a good point to wrap it up. I hope you have all learned some exciting new things today. Thank you very much for your attention.